thank you everybody for coming. Um, my name is Christian Hoffer, and um, uh, we're all here to uh, talk a bit about uh, DERF, uh, who of course is an acclaimed and um, you know, one of the premier comics artists of uh, his generation. Um, that's true. I'm not. I'm not. You know, hyping you up needlessly. You know, you you've won every award there is to win. You've you've created multiple um, just really fantastic works of comics, um, and we're going to talk a little bit about them today. But before we get started, you know, uh, I I want to do the land acknowledgement, uh, of course. Uh, Cartoon Crossroads Columbus acknowledges that the ancient ancestors of the Eastern Woodland tribes now referred to as the Adena and Hopo cultures inhabited the land we know as Ohio. Their descendants include the living nations of the Shawnee, Miami, Wyandotte, Delaware, and Seneca Cayuga. We honor and respect the diverse indigenous people connected to this place where we gather. We also like to thank our sponsors, uh, including the Greater Columbus Art Council, the Ohio Arts Council, White Castle, Columbus Foundation, UBS, the uh, Japan Foundation, and our other uh, festival sponsors. And of course, all of these programs and the expo itself is free to attend because of their support. <laughs> um, with that out of the way, um, so, you know, Durf, one of, when, when I had the opportunity to kind of take this panel, one of the things I wanted to touch upon is your connection to Ohio, because your entire career is kind of tied <laughs> to the state of Ohio from from your very earliest days seen here um, as a cartoonist for the lantern yeah Ohio uh, State that's me in my dorm room at uh, age 20 you you look very happy in that yeah I know um, I know uh, so the only important thing to take away from that is that um, you know somewhere I don't know what happened uh, I just like shed my fear you know, and I walked into the lantern and said, here, these are my crappy cartoons, publish them. And, and I don't know where that came from, because, yeah, here's front page of the lantern. The lantern was a huge broadsheet on, at Ohio State. It printed 35,000 copies a day. It was read by everybody on campus. Nope, you're too nope, far too now. too far. Yeah, sorry. Um, we'll blow through that really fast. And this is, was foundational, because without this, I would never have started my career. And, and I just, you know, I mean, before I came to Ohio State, I was probably 98% fear. But when I got here, it was just like gone. And you have to make that jump in order to start a career in comics, because, you know, it's no fear. You just have to throw your work out there, as good, bad, or ugly, and just hope that it works out and, and work your craft. And I, I marvel at that. I was actually talking about this with Jeff Smith a couple of months ago, because he came after, he was right after me yeah. at the Lantern, starting Bone. Yeah. And he was the same way. It's like, yeah, I don't know, I don't know how, you know, we never even thought about it. We just, 35,000 readers, meh. And it's all our classmates and dorm mates. And I mean, if I did a political cartoon, and I was doing political cartoons here, if I did a political cartoon about the president of the university, odds are he read it. It's amazing. You don't have that kind of penetration anywhere else. No, no. And it's, you know, the <coughs> lantern, you know, I mean, one, the lantern is still around. It but, is, yeah. Uh, I don't, uh, and you went to school for journalism yep. at OSU, which I don't think the journalism school is still around. No, they, no. That, um, which, you know, if, if a little fun side tidbit about OSU and the journalism school, that's how, you know, the Billy Ireland Cartoon Library Museum got started. It was in the first floor of the journalism building. Right? Yeah, uh, Lucy. Lucy uh, was a journalism professor. Yeah, she was. Um, and I she had was, her. I was <laughs> gonna say you. You. Uh, so you know, and that kind of touches upon another thing because all of your comics, especially your long form, we'll touch a little bit more about your your long form work after we talk a little bit about you know your. Yeah, we can blow through this stuff yeah, really but, fast. Yeah, but you know, so. Uh, so this is interesting because this is five years later. And I where mean, did you do this at? This is the Plain Dealer. Okay. I, I got hired by the Cleveland Plain Dealer. But I went from doing these rather lame, mainstreamy cartoons just because I couldn't find my voice. And five years later, I'm waking out doing stuff like this. So what was it like doing political cartoons in Cleveland in this? Like, uh, this I was the backup political cartoonist. They had like an old geezer. So I was, I was already bored with it. Okay. So I was just trying. I was doing this is scratchboard. 
I was doing collage. I was doing I was doing these really post punk type of cartoons. I think there's another one after this. No, yeah. that's back to the that, Lantern. Oh yeah, that, I got those. So yeah, so. that's the, what I was doing at the Lantern. And then suddenly I just like, I found my voice, you know? And everybody has a different point when they find it. And yeah. then with my comic strip, which came in 1990, so this is seven years after I left Ohio State, then I really found what I was looking for. And this, these appeared in all weeklies, mm -hmm. which are no longer around. Cleveland, uh, Columbus had three of them. Yeah, right? I, yeah. Columbus. Now we now we have a, a technically a monthly, but I think right, it, it's right. a dispatch rag. So. so this thing ran in like 150 alt weeklies around the country, and uh, I did this for a while. It was especially a 90s thing, but it was just a lot of fun. Uh, and it's, you know, it's kind of interesting because this is how I first you know not not to age you or anything like this but <laughs> i read the city when i was a kid I, I read those you know the the weeklies up in cleveland and you know that's how i first recognized your work long before yeah i kind of filled cleveland with <laughs> cartoons uh, <laughs> just through sheer relentlessness but it was a great uh, yeah there's there's, and there's another one yeah that was a really popular one but it kind of touches on you know your work i mean just looking at this looking at this uh, this this one kind of struck me because this is like the classic northeastern Ohio Clevelander right here in all of his glory and I say that in both positive and negative things. There's there's so many familiar little bits from mm -hmm. being a Clevelander from the buzz you know you know the buzzard uh, you know Goulardi who was a <laughs> local late night horror person stuff like that. And Jan Wenner, who's in the news again. Yeah. So this, this thing circled back around, and I was right about him. <laughs> uh. So what was it like? So you know, one of one of the considering I'm not a Clevelander. The, yeah, yeah, you're because uh, you're 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 an Akron boy. Yeah. You're you're, yeah. you're like me. Yeah. Um, so so what was it like? You know, like the Northeastern Ohio has a very distinct personality, and I say that. Um, I think that's the most politically neutral way of saying it. What, what, what was it like, you know, drawing out that personality first in these weekly Well, it's business? a lot of, there's a lot of material there, and it's fun to draw f cartoons that matter to the people that you're living with, you know, I mean, your community. I mean, we all want to do that. And I don't know if that's really possible anymore since the death of newspapers, you know. I mean, this was so immediate. You'd draw something, and then two days later, it'd be in the paper. And, you know, whatever it was, 100,000 copies of it, it'd be all over the mm -hmm. city. And that was a buzz. It was a real rush. And it was the first time that people really responded to my work in a big way. And um, I'm still chasing that buzz. I mean, and let's see what else. And that kind of brings us, you know, you know to my friend Dahmer, oh, which was, you know, your... <laughs> You know, uh, a lot of things have been said about my friend Dahmer. Um, and, you know, it was a Netflix... Uh, no, not Netflix. Oh, not, not, oh no, it, was, it, it appears on Netflix. You're you're 100 percent right. On yeah, it. no, um, it was a movie on uh, the Netflix thing is someone else. But one of the things I don't think it's touched upon very often about my friend Dahmer is that it, of course, is set in northeastern Ohio, and you really mm. bring out, you know, really capture the character of northeastern Ohio, and you know, I guess. You know, I was like thinking, it's like, oh, why was this? It's because it, you lived there. You, you lived in that experience. Well, you're right, what you know. Um, some people, there was, I did an interview in uh, Europe a while ago, and uh, last year, and uh, the interviewer wrote, uh, all his books take place within a 20 mile radius of the town he grew up in. And I was like, is that right? <laughs> Holy <laughs> shit. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, I mean, I, it wasn't by design or anything, but, you know, you write what you know. And if you're looking for the lesson there is if you're looking for stories, I mean, they're, they're there. Just look outside your front window. You know, they're around. So, what, I, you know, and, and this was one of the first things that I really wanted to talk about is, you know, when, when you were, you know, researching and writing Life Friend Don, did, did you just go back to your old haunts as like a teenager? How did you approach like trying to capture, or, or was it just like solely out of your memory? Cause, no, I mean, no, no, memory's unreliable. I mean, I learned that in journalism school. Yeah. You, know, you can't, you, you've got to corroborate things. So, I mean, I approached it as, you know, journalism 101. I mean, I went and started interviewing people people I went to school with and, and teachers and uh, anyone I could think of who had any contact with this guy, which weren't a lot, honestly. Mm -hmm. 
because he was pretty secretive. And it took me, uh, whew, I guess I started working on it about a couple weeks after he was captured in 1991, and it wasn't published until 2012. I, I, so it wow. took a while. <laughs> and, you know, I had to wait for stuff to be released, like the FBI files. Mm -hmm. When those came out, that was like a mother load of stuff. And... Uh, a few other things, but it was just slowly building this story and figuring out the timeline and figuring out what he was doing and who was where and you know, because most of the stuff was not documented. Yeah. So it was it was a real challenge, uh, but I had that advantage of being also being a local boy, so everybody knew me. Mm -hmm. They weren't like put off as if as if I was a reporter coming in and saying, "Hey, tell me about you know." your time with Dahmer, but they just knew who I was and I could approach it very casually. And that worked very well, but it, it, it was a very long, methodical process. Jumping, this is, you know. Oh, that's, a for, that's uh, the second draft. Yeah. There were, I started this project with short stories, <laughs> like about maybe a month after he died. I hadn't done anything until then, so that would have been 94, right? Anyone a Dahmer uh, trivia expert here uh, besides me? Well, I think it was 94. And um, that's that just sounded kind of, you know, that when he died, it was like, okay, maybe now I can do something. Up until that point, I'd just been collecting information. And then I did short stories, didn't like those. I did, in the late 90s, I did like a 100-page pencil draft. Mm -hmm. Couldn't sell it to anybody. Nobody was interested. Um, so I trashed that, and then I came back with uh, two more drafts in the aughts, and I think this is draft number two. So this is actually the opening sequence in the book, what would be the opening sequence, but I didn't like the way that it, you know, it's just too, the panels are too small. So I turned the top panel into actually a full splash page when I, when I published it, and that's just, you know, working the story out. You've got to, I had a learning curve here because coming from comic strips, you know, those four little panels, to now I have this open-ended book, which can be however long I want it. The real challenge was to stretch things out because I wasn't <laughs> used to that. Yeah. You know, it had to be four panels and then out. Now I had all this, I could really slow it down and I wanted this book to be like this, this dark, methodical march to the edge of the abyss. So his pacing was really important, and um, that took that took a while. That took well, it took three drafts. <laughs> um, this is another. That's just, another early one. Yeah. Yeah. This yeah. is really like a, you know, and I, I I included this one because you know it obviously mentions Ohio State. You know, everyone one of the oh, right. one, <laughs> one, one of the running jokes is is you know what one of Ohio State's like best known alumni is Jeffrey Dahmer. He didn't graduate. We no. didn't give him a degree. It was only here. He only like came here one quarter. One yeah. quarter, but uh, moral tower. If anyone's curious. Yeah. Um, but you know, and and also like this the sequence of the car. You know, this is you know uh, I, I did want to, like ask you like where exactly is this set? Like um, like is this in like the valley? Is this in like just the outskirts of... Yeah, this is my hometown, yeah. uh, which is a little town right outside Akron. It's, it's actually bordering the national park up there. Yeah, it's not So it's beautiful countryside, but at night it's really creepy, and that's what I was trying to evoke here badly with the drawing t tools I had at the time. This is very... I mean, this is what my comic strip looked like, right? I mean, it was mm -hmm. just... I couldn't make that transition. I was having trouble with that transition from this post-punk oddball comic strip to a serious graphic novel, and this is what I came up with, which is completely inadequate. So, and here, oh, that's that, last now report. you're jumping ahead. I know, I keep doing that, I'm sorry. It's <laughs> no, it's okay. The power of the clicker. You're right, um, you're drunk with power. Uh, but, you know, um, it, it, and one of the things is, like, I, I don't think that you know, it, this has a level of creepiness to it, obviously, it involves Jeffrey Dahmer. Right. But a lot of ink on there. <laughs> yeah. um, and, you know, but the, the darkness and, like, the, the, the bits with the woods in the background on that sixth mm -hmm. panel, right. um, you know, it just really captures that feeling of, you know, it, it, there's, it's really evocative of, like, you know, edge of the valley um, and, you know, 
dark because it, it's a it's a really beautiful but also deeply haunting place and you know oh yeah yeah um, well I grew up in a yeah I grew up in a house very similar to Dahmer's which was like a 50s mod thing on a hillside overlooking a valley okay. and at day it's beautiful and at night it's just like this you know obsidian black yeah. walls all of glass it's like who's out there staring at me you know it used to freak me out when I was a kid so that's <laughs> That's the type of memory and feeling that I'm pulling when I was composing these scenes. And the final book is a lot better yeah. than you see here, but it was the same kind of stuff. And again, that's writing what you know. You know you're pulling from memory, and I've always found that to be really, really effective. Um, now, hopping forward a bit. Cause that's a actually, well, that's hopping. It's a little bit, right? Yeah, well, the early Dahmer stuff was uh, late 90s, early aughts, so now, this is Punk Rock and Trailer Parks, which was mid-aughts. Because uh, I decided after I did that, that early Dahmer stuff, it's like, oh, this sucks. And <laughs> I, I, I just wasn't happy with it. And I knew I was only going to get one shot at my friend Dahmer when I, when I you know, got it published. So I thought, I need to learn how to do a graphic novel. And so I went off and did this, which is just a goofy comedy that I had in my head that I wanted to tell and have fun with, but more importantly, it was a place to learn how to make a graphic novel, how to pace it, how to compose it, how to do the story arcs and tie chapters together and doing the overarching narrative, all that stuff I learned here. So this is a very important book, which is unfortunately out of print right now because the publisher went out of business, but um, it'll be back in print at some point, but uh, it's a very important book in my career, yeah. See, I always yeah. There's no more. And you know, and once again, this is all you know set up you know within the same same settings. So yeah, you, this, this is, is all set in Akron. Oh, so is it? It's like a love story to Akron and all its derelict, destitute glory. See, I never, I never knew that the Clash came to Akron. Oh yeah, they they played the Civic Theater in Akron. Really? Yeah. That's Curtis Blow opened for them. Oh my God. Yeah. There. Were you? Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> yeah. What? You're good friends with Joe. Yeah, I'm good friends with Joe, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, yeah, no, it was, uh, so I, I was pulling, actually, Punk Rock and Trailer Parks is half Akron shows that I went to and half Columbus shows. Okay. Because I was down here by that point in my, you know, my punk rock career, which we went over yesterday in the panel. But most of my, those early, late 70s, early 80 days were down here in Columbus. Well, and, and you know Akron, it's it's uh, you, you've I've read you know you've mentioned it in multiple of your graphic novels you know but you know Akron Akron does have like a, a pretty interesting music scene. A oh, lot very of great was bands. past tense. Well, you know. But, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, no, no scenes last long, but no, it was it was significant and it was a lot of fun, and uh, that energy I'm trying to capture with this book and and uh, um, yeah, I was very I was very happy with the way this came out. So oh, let's see here. And so then that brings us to Trashed, which once again, you know, now this was, so now I- Now you are skipping. I am <laughs> skipping, I'm sorry. It's because I only have 35 minutes to it's, talk uh, about. <laughs> you know, and I really wanted to touch, talk about Kent State. Right, but, you okay, know, well let's just blow through this then. Yeah, but, this you know, is trash. But this is, this is, and this is the Akron, this is Akron's um, yeah. uh, dump scene. But you know, I did want to talk about like, how did you approach Trash differently than My Friend Dahmer and Kent State? Kent State is a very historical comic, right? And My Friend Dahmer is kind of a mix of both. But you know, Trash obviously is a. Uh, but you know, you can still see like the the your journalistic approach to it come mm -hmm. out. So how did you approach this differently? That was the one thing. Well, I Well, Trash was also fiction, so okay. that's a big difference. So it's based on experience. I was a garbage man. Yeah. Uh, before I came to Ohio State, it was a garbage man for a year. After I dropped out of art school, so art school dropout working for 25 cents over minimum wage in my hometown as a garbage man. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you know, I had to crawl. It made man out of me, honestly. <laughs> I mean, it really was uh, a life-changing event, and it made a great story. I mean, trashed is just—it's a lot of fun. And yeah, I worked in all this serious stuff about this secret world of garbage, which was, uh, you know, I like to tell stories that haven't been told, and, or at least haven't been told in the way that I want to tell them. And I like, to, I like surprises in a story. So this one, this one is full of it. And 
and that kind of I skipped over something. This this is another I I really the did good my around. friend Dahmer you skipped over. Yeah, I <coughs> yes I did. I apologize. <coughs> I'm sorry. Um, this is just another. I just absolutely love this. Oh story. yeah, thank um, you. That's uh, Prospect Avenue in Cleveland. Yeah. in like the late seventies. Um, but that takes us to Kent State. Mm -hmm. um, now, I, I how why did you decide to do Kent State? Like, was there, was there a particular driving force behind Yeah, that? there was. Um, bef the, when I was 10 years old, uh, the National Guard that eventually opened fire at Kent State, these guys, uh, were dispatched to my hometown mm -hmm. to uh, stamp out a trucker strike that was taking place, a Teamster strike that had gotten a little out of hand because uh, the trucking companies tried to use uh, strike breakers to break through the line and the International Brotherhood of Teamsters did not take kindly to this. <laughs> and there were shots fired and all kinds of nastiness. So the guard was sent in <coughs> and they invaded my hometown and, and they actually camped right across the street from my elementary school. Like I said, I was 10 years old and it just totally freaked me out. I mean, you know, that moment when the world rushes in, mm -hmm. right? And I remember when, uh, the school buses went down where the guard was deployed on the stretch of road with guardsmen on either side with bayonets drawn and guns. Yeah. The bus driver made the kids lie on the floor of the bus. Oh my God. As if that would do anything. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> They're carrying M1s. But um, it, it just, and no one talked to us about this. So it was just, we were just left to process on our own. And then like three days later, the massacre. So it was in the news, people were talking about it. The entire state, certainly, all of Ohio, but I think really the whole country just froze in its tracks. Mm -hmm. And I remember that feeling. And so I've always carried this story with me ever since. And I've always followed the news and, and the revelations that have taken place over the years, because there was a massive cover-up. They got away with it. And um, over the years, the truth has slowly leaked out, and that's always been a news story when it happened. So I've always followed that, and also working in Northeast Ohio media, you know, it was, it was covered. Yeah. And I just thought, man, this is a great story, and no one has really told it the right way. And especially a narrative, a visual narrative. And, you know, that was, I just thought it was an opportunity, mm -hmm. and so I, I decided to take it on. It's... When I was, you know, when I said I was going to go and do this, I told a coworker of mine, uh, you know, and I worked <coughs> here in Columbus, mm -hmm. and I told him, I was like, yeah, I'm interviewing a guy who did a graphic novel about the Kent State shooting scene. She goes, what was that? Yeah. And, you know, that, that really struck me as, <laughs> I guess, I think, you know, one, I, I you know, I, I'm from Akron. Um, my grandfather was at the shooting. And, you know, that's just something that is just, I could know, you know, I think that living in Akron, especially 20, 30 years after it happened, as the truth came out, um, you, this was something that we all know. Yeah, yeah, northeast quadrant of the state definitely is part of the DNA up there. Um, and so it was really shocking to me, and that really, like, it actually really drove it home, the importance of this book. Right. Oh, thanks. Um, um, it was a challenge because, you know, I'm not, I mean, obviously, I went to Ohio State. I didn't go to Kent State. Yeah. So I've never lived in Kent. Yeah. I spent some time there, but I've never lived there. So I was a complete outsider, which was actually a little bit of an advantage, I think, because they're still arguing up there. I mean, it's just unbelievable. There's like uh, the uh, Kent protest community is still around. They're all in their 70s now. And there was one point with, <laughs> before the book was published where they started sniping at each other online. And one of, them, one of them accused the other of being a Trotskyite. And I was like, <laughs> what year is this? I mean, it's the same, the same argument they were having in 1969. You know, it's, it's God bless them. I mean, they're, they're passionate people. And, and, uh, and they were certainly royally screwed. I mean, they were deeply wronged. Yeah. Um, and, you know, and oh, there's the, that's yeah, the I was about to say, it's funny that I, I, it was one of the few instances that I didn't click ahead to. Ah, uh, there you go. Um, yeah, that's what it looked like. Yeah, that was the trucker strike. But, you know, so when you were interviewing. And that's me. And that's you. <laughs> that's, and, and you do such a fascinating job of framing this 
you know, and framing like the, the tragedy of Kent State. Yeah. Uh, and the, the, you know, one, one of the things I absolutely love about your book, and I kind of, you know, I don't know if I was just too close to it or if, you know, too young to remember the political, I mean, I don't remember the political landscape right. alive. Well, I barely do. Yeah, yeah, especially you were 10, but you didn't, <coughs> and I think this is one of the impressive things. You capture like why Rhodes was so like gung ho about sending right. sending. That's the our government. beloved governor at the time, Rhodes, Governor James A. Rhodes, who uh, was governor for like sixteen years. Yeah, he uh, and you know, I think now we have term limits because of him. Uh, uh, there were term limits then. He oh, took a term they? off and came back. Oh. <laughs> we couldn't get rid of him. Um, yeah, no, it was a real challenge to you know what I had to do was just like kind of ram myself into nineteen seventy. Mm -hmm and look around and see what was happening nationally, what was happening in the state, and what was happening specifically in Kent. Yeah. And that took a lot of, as you can see, that took a lot of homework. I spent uh, four years on this book. The first two years were just research, like you see here. Mm -hmm. And then two years to draw while I continued to research and uh, you know, trying to coax interviews out of people who were there. I mean, my idea was to frame this book, you know, you got to figure out, okay, how, how, what's my book about? How am I going to do this? How am I going to do that it's different? I mean, it's comics, so that's different right on the face. But what I decided to do was tell it entirely through the eyes of the four, the four kids who were killed. Mm -hmm. Allison, Jeff, Sandy, and Bill. And the oldest was uh, 21, and the youngest was 19. And she had just turned 19. And so what I wanted to do is show every scene in the book is one of them seeing what's happening, seeing what's unfolding, at least one. And so you're right there at their shoulder, and you walk through these four days with them. And, you know, when they're cut down, it packs a wallop. It does. It's um, a... Which was my evil design. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I wanted that. I wanted this to be history that was felt in the way that the students of 1970 still feel it. Because, you know, those interviews there, that's a pile of interviews there I did with people who were there. And I can't tell you how many of those interviews ended with the person in tears. And these are grandparents now. And they, I mean, it just took them right back to being, you know, a 20-year-old kid in, in 1970. And what they saw in front, I mean, these people literally you know, the Neil Young song, what would you do if you saw her dead on the ground? Well, these people did. What an inappropriate announcement. I know. That wow. wow. That couldn't come at any um, worse timing. <laughs> and that's the power of that. I was trying to tap that emotion and really get it into the book. I wanted people to really understand what that was like for these kids. Well, and then you dig through, this is an intelligence report from, all of this stuff is out in the public domain now. You know, the FBI files you can get, it's like 30,000 documents. The only thing that's still secret is the CIA files. Oh my God. They're still classified. And they were there. They were there. Uh, it's hard to imagine the degree of, of government infiltration to events like this. The FBI was there, military intelligence was there, the CIA was there on a college campus. And we don't know what all of them were up to. And you know, one of the thorough lines in this is you follow one of the informants during that. He's yeah. you know, taking pictures of you know, the protesters mm -hmm. and gathering information. Yeah. And you know, that, it's another thing that you- He was up to no good. <laughs> um, so, <coughs> Now, you know, you mentioned that, you know, you did all these interviews and uh, things like that, and they're, the, the primary sources are kind of whittling away a little bit because, you know, uh, of the nine people who survived the shooting, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, three are dead, and Alan Canfora, who's the most well-known. The wounded, so, yeah, at least three. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, Alan Canfora died recently. Yeah, he died yeah. during COVID. One of the guard officers just died. Oh, did yeah, it? we're losing the opportunity for the the absolute truth to come out. Now, did that factor into, or did that impact your research at all? Did it impact, well, it factored into, I better get on this book yeah. or these people are going to be gone. Yeah, it did. I was thinking about that. <laughs> um, but, uh, no, it didn't factor into it once I started. Mm -hmm. I mean, the guardsmen have still not talked. None of them. Did you, did, and you reached out to them, of course. I did. I talked to two uh, guardsmen who were not shooters. 
There were 1,200 guardsmen on campus. Only about a dozen actually opened fire into the crowd for reasons known only to them. Mm, and see. all of those guys have maintained an absolute wall of silence. And at this point, you have to say, well, they're, they're not talking because they can't talk because there's no statute of limitation on a federal, uh, federal murder, you know, murder, yeah. murder one. There's no statute of limitation on that. So they could still be prosecuted like the old Klansmen were prosecuted, you know. There was one that was just prosecuted like five years ago. So they, they, they just can't talk. I mean, it's the only possible explanation left. Were, were there any surprises that came out? I'm flipping through just to show some <coughs> other images, so I really want to show. Right. Oh, that's show yeah, that's yeah. uh, Columbus up top. Yeah, it's another bit. I was just like, <laughs> it's like you know, like watching right. people get beaten in the backdrop of longs. Right. Did you? Well, that was another. Yeah, that was another uh, a hobby of mine. When I was here at Ohio State, I was walking around the Oval one day, and I noticed uh, it's forgotten history, right? Yeah. I noticed that. Some of the asphalt had worn away, and there was brick underneath on the pathway. And I just thought, what moron would order a brick walkway to be covered in asphalt? And I brought it up later in uh, in one of my journalism classes. And the old the prof, who was a geezer, he'd been around a while. He said, "Oh, that's because of the riots in 1970." And I went, "What riots?" And it turns out the riots at Ohio State were far worse than the riots mm -hmm. at Kent State. It was called the Nine Hour War. And it was a running battle across campus between the highway patrol and these thousands of student radicals. They were throwing furniture out of the window on top of them. They had to whisk the president of the university and his administration out under armed guard to Fawcett Center to set up an administration in exile. And then it spilled into the neighborhoods when the Columbus cops started firing tear gas indiscriminately mm -hmm. into frat houses. All the students poured out. Then the cops tried to clear them out. The students turned on the cops, and suddenly the cops are getting the shit kicked out of them. <laughs> and they finally, Rhodes sent in the guard. He yeah. sent in like, uh, uh, how many guardsmen was it? 4,000 yeah. guardsmen, I think? Yeah, something like that. Yeah. It, was far, it was more than at Kent State. And it's, there were clouds of tear gas drifting into Clintonville. And people had completely forgotten about this by the time I was here, which was only like 12 years later. My, uh, my, so I worked at Long's uh, when I was in college, and my boss at <laughs> Long's was in Long's when the night oh, really? war happened. Oh, wow. really? So he told me He told me about that, and it's just like, you know, you talk about like the football riots and stuff like that. And, it's, and like, people get freaked out, like, oh, no, a car got flipped. And it's like, you know, that's totally different. <laughs> that that, different. That's real shit right there. Well, they firebombed, uh, they firebombed a building. Yeah. Uh, two students were shot by parties unknown, probably vigilantes circling the campus. Yeah. And, they, uh, and they were prying the bricks up out the walkway, which is why they were paved and throwing them at the <laughs> highway patrol. Uh, there's some great photos of that stuff. But they shut the university for like a month. Yeah, no, it was serious. Every university in the country was blowing up like this. And people, it's really hard to grasp. I mean, I was vaguely aware of it, but uh, the, the nation really teetered on the edge of mass insurrection. Every single university was exploding like this, all because of the Vietnam War, of course, specifically the draft. And the, that entire generation just said, enough. We're not going to Vietnam anymore. And Nixon said, oh, yes, you are. And they said, no, we're not. And that's where the conflict came. And the question was how far would the authorities go to enforce their will? And Kent State is the answer. And that probably. Yeah, yep. They were willing up. to. They were willing to to kill, to enforce their to enforce their authority. Now, so I, I do have to ask kind of like the cheesy last question mm -hmm. um, because I do want to open this up to Q and A. But you know, there's there are some parallels to the sort of <coughs> powder keg that was going on during Vietnam and now. And oh, during sure, the, yeah. You know, like, uh, do, you, do you think there will be another Kent State? Um, do you think that, you know, things have changed enough? Well, it sort of depends who, <laughs> it sort of depends on what happens in 2024. Um, yes and no. I thought, you know, this book was supposed to come out in spring 2020 and it got delayed because of the pandemic 
you may recall that fun little episode. And uh, over the summer, as the book is sitting, you know, in the warehouse, um, the BLM protests exploded. And I just thought, oh, shit. <laughs> this is, from a personally selfish standpoint, there's going to be another mass shooting and then no one will give a shit about this book. I'm allowed to be petty like that because, you know, I'm an author. <laughs> um, but it didn't happen. And I think it didn't happen specifically because of Kent State. Since Kent State... The authorities in this country, local, state, federal, have spent trillions of dollars investing and developing a wide array of crowd control weaponry that mm -hmm. did not exist in 1970. All in 1970, all they had was gas masks, gas, and guns, and, and clubs. That's what they had. Now they've got body armor, they've got you know sound cannons, heat guns, a whole the vehicles, the shields, all of that stuff is because of Kent State. Because nobody wants to be these guys. They want to beat the shit out of us if we get out of hand <laughs> without, you know, without killing us. And so that's the unusual legacy of Kent State, the Kent State Massacre, and Jackson State, which happened three weeks yeah, later. Three days, yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. um, kind of depressing to think about. <laughs> oh, yeah. And with Jackson State, you know, that's... Uh, I always often wonder. Kent State's obviously the more publicized version. You know, we had a song written by about yeah. it, and people always forget about Jackson State. And I kind of wonder why that is. Um, yeah, I don't. Well, because it was massively covered up. Yeah. I mean, it was Mississippi, so um, you know, it was all completely suppressed by the media. And there were not. There was not a lot of media on on campus when it happened. There was lots at Kent State. We have the, all those photos, those shocking photos, uh, mm -hmm. that we don't have that at Jackson State. So all of that, and of course it was also a black college. Yeah. So all of those things combined to uh, make it you know, less of a, of a national event. Um, well, as I've taken up enough of your time, so I'm <laughs> going to turn to the audience. Uh, so yes, go ahead. Uh, thank you for making this book. Oh, sure. And uh, what made you choose uh, to decide to end it the way uh, you did with the anecdote with Nixon? Um, well, I think it's really chilling. And uh, I can't give that away for those of you who haven't read the book. But um, uh, I found that anecdote and I just thought, oh, that's perfect. You know, it's just kind of right after the footnotes. Just My editor likes to have that last kind of little thing at the end. Um, well, no, he just, he just likes that. The, my friend Dahmer is two. Um, because I told him, well, I've got these two, which one do you want? He said, let's use them both. So, I mean, that's just his thing. <laughs> so uh, I think it's a nice, little, a nice little touch, just kind of a what the fuck, walk off, you know. It's, uh, that so is, that, that was the decision making. My, my reaction. Yeah. I, I, I had never seen that one, like read about that. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. sure. Anyone else? Yeah. Yes, go ahead. Uh, question about Dahmer, the research in Dahmer. Mm -hmm. In your research for that, did you get any roadblocks where someone just absolutely would not talk to you? Or, in that vein, after you came out, did anybody like, call you and curse you out or anything? Uh, not curse me out, no, but people would call me. Um, yeah, it was a different, it was a different, uh, boy, that was, that's a good question. It was a different process. Um, there were people in my friend Dahmer who wouldn't talk, of course. They just didn't want to be associated with this guy at all. And, um, and I respected that. I had people who did talk, so I had plenty of material there as far as first-person accounts. Um, and with Kent, it was a different, yeah, there are people who've never talked, obviously the guardsmen, but a lot of the students, there are students who have never talked. And I did get some of them to talk. I mean, I was introduced through other people. And again, being a local guy, that really kind of helped me because people knew me, they knew my reputation. It's like, oh yeah, you're that guy. And, you know, all you need is an introduction, and, and that's kind of a way in. But I did have other people who, who I had to be really gentle with because they're like, you know, I don't want to trigger my PTSD, and I don't want to talk about this. Well, let me just ask, can I just ask you this one little detail? And just kind of coax it out of me. I had to be very gentle and not go too far. Um, with people coming after the book came out, that was particularly a, a, a really aggravating part of my friend Dahmer. 
they would approach me. I had no idea they were connected. And, oh, yeah, did I ever tell you about, you know, this or that? And I'm like, oh, damn it, where were you six months ago when I was <laughs> finishing this book? So, um, and sometimes it would confirm some of my stuff, so that was good. But, yeah, that was a really frustrating part of my, I just didn't know where those people were, you know, because they were, they'd all been in, in the shadows since, it, since the news hit. Because it was a massive news event when it first came out in 91. And we were all being, like, hounded. And I was in media, and it was still unnerving for me. I remember looking out my window one morning, drinking a cup of coffee, and there's three camera trucks in front of my house, oh waiting my for, like, a sign of movement so they could, you know, you know, jump me if I came out the front door. I went out the back door and hopped the fence <laughs> and went down to the train to, get, to go downtown. Yeah, and so, I mean, and I was experienced with media, so imagine somebody who wasn't. I mean, it was really, the creepiest thing was, uh, I'll tell this, a little off topic, but <clears throat> Dahmer's house is on this long country road. Five miles, five miles was media trucks the week after this thing broke because the cops were in, in, his, uh, in his yard. They had roped off the yard with yellow police tape, and we're sifting through the dirt looking for bone fragments from his first victim. They found uh, 50. Biggest one was that big. Jesus Christ. Uh, he had crushed all the, the bone. He turned his kid to powder. And so they're doing this, and there's this massive crowd up and down the road, which is closed. And across the street from Dahmer's house, the two little girls who live there set up a lemonade stand at the end of their driveway <laughs> to take advantage of this. You know, they'd never had a crowd of people like this before on this road. And that is like, you know, welcome to my world. That was, that was Dahmer 101 right there. <laughs> and it was just one thing after another with that. I mean, it was really a very surreal period of time. Does that answer your question? I think, Mr. Philippe. No. How well written they are. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> um, I'm just wondering um, how much time you spent on them or if you have any other outlets for writing like that because they're, oh. they're always really thoughtful and really insightful and, and really interesting. Oh, thanks. Well, my journalism profs, if those that are still living, would, uh, would, <laughs> would say thank you. Uh, I got a good education at Ohio State. You know, it really was a good school. And uh, um, yeah, I don't really, do, I don't really write for anybody. I mean, I write for my books, and that's a lot of work. And I do the social media stuff, and that just is enough for me. You know, it's uh, only so much time in the day. But thank you very much. I, I do put some effort into those. Especially when somebody, it's something I care about, you know, something that I think is significant. Yeah. Have you thought about what, the, you know, the new information you got from after my friend Tom was going back and doing the, the second edition they're adding? You know, you've got to leave stuff behind. <laughs> you, you've got to leave it behind. At a certain point, you just have to say, okay, that's the book. Um, there was a uh, one scene added immediately after the book came out, which it was added to the E edition and is in the foreign editions, which will probably be added to the English edition with the next printing, which will be the 20th, I think. Oh, 20th printing. Um, that's when Dahmer got paddled at school, <laughs> which is one of those things that a friend came after. Did I ever tell you the time Dahmer got paddled? It's like, what? <laughs> <laughs> And I had talked to this guy, you know, hours and hours and hours of it just had never come up and he never thought to mention it. And it's like, oh man, you're killing me. But I did I had to add that one. I had to add that one. Yeah. Right? Yeah, that is. That is the problem with memory, yeah. If it's not documented, it's it's really tough to to pull that stuff together or coax it out unless you ask the right questions and you know, that's just luck of the draw. <coughs> I have a question for you. Yeah. One more question that has nothing to do. What, what are you working on now? 
Uh, another book, but I can't give the topic away yet until the first draft is done. But it's a period piece, actually. It's something completely different. So I like to do different things, you know, just what, however many books I have left in me. Uh, it is not. <laughs> Part of it is. Part of it is. Oh. And specifically, it's not because of that interview. I said, <laughs> damn it. <laughs> I've got to do something else. I've got to take a different setting. And settings are important, so you know it's it's uh, it's tricky to, to, to do that. Yeah. Um, I was a Landry cartoonist too back Were in you? the '90s. Yeah. So um, when I was working there, there was anywhere from like five to three scripts that were there. Uh -huh. I'm curious as to when you were working on it, was there any, anybody else other than you that were, was doing cartoon work at the time? Jeff Smith. <laughs> we were on the paper at the same time. He was doing his early Bone stuff, which was called Thorn. Then it's like a little comic strip. And uh, there was another guy who went on to work for the Dispatch named Steve Spencer, who sadly is not with us anymore. Uh, he did a strip, and I don't think anybody else really coming. I mean, there were like, I was doing political cartoons. I can't even remember why. Um, I think because they ran the political cartoons bigger than they ran the comic <laughs> strips. I'm serious. <laughs> this is why I decided to do it. I was like, all right, I'll do that. Um, and I was like the third in a row of uh, political cartoonists who went pro after The Lantern. So there were three of us. Scott Willis and uh, Brian Bassett were my predecessors, and they both went pro, which was not easy to do even then. There were only like 350 political cartoonists maybe in the country, staff. There are no there's, no there's like 25 now. Yeah, it's not a thing anymore. No. Um, so it was a ridiculous thing to go into, but somehow I pulled it off, and they pulled it off too. And then, uh, um, not Nate Powell, Nick Anderson oh. came after us who won a Pulitzer. So there was these four political cartoonists who all went pro in a row. It was amazing. It was a real, it was a real spawning ground of cartoonists. Just because it was an opportunity, it was absolutely nothing the university did. <laughs> It was nothing the School of Journalism did. In fact, they just openly discouraged it. But because there was that opportunity to be published and be read and have people respond, you know, it was a real, people flocked to this campus to be a cartoonist for a brief period of time. Has anyone got like the, I guess now three of you, because you said one of them passed away. Has, has By who? The, the political cartoons, so all one in a row, like went yeah. pro. Have yeah. you guys all ever just sat down and talked uh, about that? We, we did have a, there was a, the university actually had a Lantern reunion last year. <laughs> How and, was that? And the three of us were there. Yeah. It was great. It was fun. And uh, um, that's the first time I've met the other two. We were all together in the same room. So, yeah, it was great. Yeah, it was, it was fabulous. We got time for one more question, if anyone's got one. Yeah. <laughs> my friend Dower. Um, yeah, I was happy with it, actually. Um, it's different than the book. Uh, they made some decisions that I may not have agreed with, or you know, we argued about, but it was his movie to make. And when you pass off a, you know, a book to someone to do something like that, you have to make peace with that, you know, that they're going to interpret it in their own way. And in fact, when I signed the book for him, we, he came to Akron, I actually walked him through the, the book. We went to Dahmer's house, we were looking in the yard, and you know, the owner let us in the house. And he had me sign a book, and all I, you know, I told him, I said, look, I got nothing to lose here. You know, the book's out, it's won all these awards, it's, you know, people like it, you gotta live up to the book. Mm -hmm. And so I just wrote on the title page when I signed his book, don't fuck it up. <laughs> <laughs> and he treasures that cop. <laughs> Well, uh, thank you, everybody, for attending. Thanks for thank coming. Thank you, Dirk.